I'm Priscilla Barrera with the Investing News Network, and here with me today is John Kaiser of Kaiser Research. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Priscilla, thank you for having me on Investing News Network. All right, so we're here at BRIC 2020. To start, I wanted to ask you about uh, gold prices. We've seen gold prices rally this year. Where do you see gold going in 2020? Well, last year we had a uh, significant move from 1300 to 1550, and there was a very muted response amongst the resource juniors to the gold price. And gold is behaving well so far this year, and there are signs that the market is starting to take the move in gold seriously because 1550 gold is a lot better than 1100 to 1300. Now, I have a view that's different from most people's view about gold. We are in a uh, very low inflation environment. Uh, the US dollar has been strong. Uh, it's not clear against whose currency it's supposed to decline and provide the usual argument uh, for gold going up. We do have the deficit in the United States climbing, climbing, climbing. So that argument for eventually there'll be a come up and stay uh, for owning gold, uh, that's still valid. But there's something different going on. And I'm saying this period is very similar to the 70s when gold went from $35 to 850 and then settled back at $400. And we had basically a 25 year bear market in gold after that. But that was a significant real price move. And part of it was adjustment for accumulated inflation from the you know, 1930s onwards. But a key part of it was a uh, linked to uncertainty about where America at that time, the leader of the free world, uh, uh, what's happening to it. They got booted out of Vietnam. Uh, uh, OPEC uh, put the boots to them with the uh, the oil shock, uh, then the hostage taking in, in Iran, and then the uh, Afghanistan invasion by the Soviets. So it really looked like America was losing it. Now, as it turned out, they didn't. They stabilized everything and gold hit a low. And during that period, the gold stock, the above ground gold stock was worth uh, uh, was was 25% of global GDP. And in 2000, when America was actually the leader of the entire world, no longer just the free world, uh, it was only 4%. When it recently ran up to 1900, that was a 14% of global GDP for what the 6 billion ounces that now exist, and it settled back to 11%. That big move from 2003 to uh, 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 2011, that was really an inflation catch up because you take $400 gold in 1980, inflation adjusted to the present, uh, that's 1277 So this recent move, it's only 20% real move and therefore it doesn't make a big, that big a difference, which is why the investors have been reluctant to take it seriously. But I think we are in a period of extreme rising uncertainty, similar to the 70s about what is America's ongoing role in the world and if it withdraws into itself and lets the whole world just do whatever it pleases, uh, the, f the future becomes very cloudy. And I think we're in the midst of a repricing into the $2,000 to $3,000 range and that 25% that we saw in 1980 at, at the at 850, that's equivalent to $3,500. So there is a history for seeing gold, the asset class, reprice itself. And if we get that sort of move and it'll stabilize somewhere in the 2000 to 3000 range, that's a significant real price move, which will have a profound impact on the juniors, obviously for the producers, ounces in the ground, but also for exploration companies because it lowers the bar for what counts as a discovery. So I think this year we may even challenge $2,000. All right, and, and you're mentioning we've seen a lot of geopolitical tension. Uh, we've seen uh, the trade war deal happening, but it's also an election year in the US. How do you see that factor impacting gold? I think uh, it doesn't really matter what the outcome is because much of the uncertainty is linked to the Trump administration's uh, policy. So if Trump is back in, the uncertainty factor is not going back. Uh, Trump's building the deficit to uh, record levels. Uh, uh, he's going to keep doing that. Uh, if the Democrats get in, they're not known for decreasing uh, the deficit, even though 
every Republican administration except for Obama has increased the deficit by a bigger amount than any other prior administration. So in terms of uh, the anxiety about uh, debt and, uh, and the price of gold will be good for gold. But the biggest thing that I'm looking for is to see which party comes out and pounds the table and says, when my next when our term starts, we're going to engage in infrastructure renewal because that's a promise Trump has not kept, renewing America's decaying infrastructure. And that's good for the other metal economies because that requires real things. Gold isn't really used for anything. And that, of course, would boost the, uh, the uh, uh, deficit even further because you're going to have the government doing capital spending to repair bridges, redo the grid, and all that. So if that theme starts to emerge and both parties are capable of pushing that theme, then we could have a perfect storm of gold going higher and the macro economy not failing, but also staying alive. All right, and moving away for a second from gold, we've also seen other precious metals like platinum, palladium uh, prices going higher this year. Are you interested in those? And do you say it's still a good time? I've been watching palladium. Uh, palladium uh, is rising because uh, the uh, Volkswagen diesel scandal, so a major shift away from uh, 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 diesel cars, which use rely platinum, which is why platinum so weak. Combust gasoline combustion cars use uh, palladium in their catalytic converters, but there's also a slowdown in uh, Norilsk mine, the, the big nickel mine in Russia, which has a major palladium byproduct. So there's been a decrease in supply while they do a major expansion. And that expansion won't be done till 2022. So now we're seeing a classic, you know, the, it's, it's, a, it's a metal that everybody needs. There's been an increase in demand from the shift from platinum palladium. And, and Friday it went up a hundred bucks. It's now going up in hundred dollar increments. Now it did that back in 2001 or something like that when it ran from 150 to a thousand dollars, then eventually went, went way back down again. It's probably not sustainable at these levels, but if it settles back to 1500, that's huge. And so we're starting to see the juniors that have these uh, sort of uh, platinum palladium uh, deposits, often with a nickel or copper credit, uh, they're starting to get attention in the market. We've had a number of sort of cobalt running way up, vanadium running way up, and then collapsing back. And the market has been reluctant to really take the PGM space seriously. And I think that will change this year. I think the PGM stories are going to get traction. All right, and before we talk about the companies you like right now, I wanted to ask about something you've been talking for a while, which is about being, bringing back this uh, post-boomer audience. How do we do that? Okay, so a boomer is anybody born uh, uh, before 1965. I call post-boomers uh, Generation X, Millennials, Generation Z, uh, Z. Um, uh, post boomers as a whole group. That group is not really plugged into the junior resource sector market. They figured out the cannabis game and the crypto game and, and that, uh, mainly momentum based games, try and make a whole bunch of money really quickly, but they don't understand the space. And this year, every boomer is 55 years or older. And according to the Canadian banking establishment, resource juniors are unsuitable for that class in which uh, group of people in which I am in. So my concern is the uh, traditional audience is fading, it's being marginalized by the regulators, but a younger audience is not coming into the space. And I think the biggest challenge is to get the younger people to start to take this resource junior space seriously. And one step that they can do is allow them, allow people to participate in private placements without being a millionaire and accredited investor because most post boomers are not millionaires so they can't participate in these private placements they have done an important step with the what they call the existing security holder exemption where you can buy up to fifteen thousand dollars per company per year which is good forces you to diversify um, but the existing shareholder part is an impractical thing it's almost like a, a fake reform because they added that it's not necessary it's basically implying that their entire regulatory disclosure system is worthless 
and that if I hear there's a private placement, I go to CDAR and go to the website and check it out. That's inadequate. I need to have already talked to the company and own shares. That is absolute nonsense. They should remove that existing requirement and open up the entire space to this massive audience. The juniors absolutely need money coming in from many sources because otherwise it's just a small percentage that are run by the cabals that get all the funding and that's not good for a diverse ecosystem. All right, um, my last question for you today for the investors that are watching us today. I wanted to ask in the current state of the market, how should they approach this season? Which companies do you think will be the winners? So, so I think gold is the most obvious metal. I think this trend is in place. We are now tracking real price gains. So you look for stocks which are might be so-so at the, you know, $1,300, $1,500, but if they're at $2,000, they're way in the money. And my favorite is Midas Gold. And uh, it's permitting a 300,000 plus ounce per year mine in Idaho with an antimony byproduct credit. And uh, at, uh, you know, $1,500 gold, you know, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. The stock's 60 cents, uh, but uh, if it's uh, gold's at $2,000, dollars this is a four to six dollar stock so there's a potential 10 bagger from owning a company like this and this is also a stock that's really suitable for the post boomers because yes post boomers like boomers want to make a lot of money quickly but post boomers are also have a concern for the long-term future that boomers don't really have and the the Stip Night project is actually a reclamation project of a polluted disaster area funded by a gold mine. So this is actually restoring an area that was ruined in World War II when they mined it for antimony. And this will be done properly. It's been a hideous permitting cycle. And uh, uh, if it's in production, then America has an antimony byproduct because 85% of that comes from China. And I don't think the big power game that's now going between China and the United States is going to end anytime soon. And I have a suspicion it could even veer off in a bad direction. So there's an example of something that's really good for, for post boomers. Um, another type of stock that uh, I'm interested in is uh, something like uh, Zephyr Minerals. Now they have an existing gold project that's small, the company's fairly valued for that, but they also generated a Broken Hill style zinc lead silver target that's got a geophysical footprint of sort of 40 to 80 million tons, like a Cannington. Now that's something, if you find another Cannington, that's a $2 billion home run, and the company's got a $12 million valuation. So looking for plays like this where the geology is all worked up, ready for drilling, you could get more than a 10 bag. Zephyr Minerals is potentially my Arizona mining for 20, 2020, and Arizona mining I picked at this conference at 35 cents, and it got taken out for two billion cash at six dollars. Zephyr has only 60 million shares fully diluted, whereas uh, uh, Arizona Mining ended up with 340 million, so the upside. And that's, we need to see like spectacular gains. Another example is one that started moving, Azimut Exploration. It tripled this week because one of their prospects uh, delivered results, which although it's a small footprint, uh, in the geological context that they've created, uh, this is potentially a major multi-million ounce uh, medium to high grade discovery. But it's also showing that that James Bay area area has potential that's not classic like you have in the Abitibi Greenstone Belt, but still potentially there and you just got to do the work. And then there's two other types of companies, uh, 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 two companies, FPX Nickel, which is coming back to life. I followed that for a decade. Uh, uh, they've done some substantial changes to the uh, fundamentals, the flow sheet in that. Uh, they're going to update their PEA this year. I think they're going to show that it works at six dollar plus uh, nickel and and this is interesting because they recently figured out how to make nickel sulfate from the concentrate and nickel sulfate is what you need for the electric vehicle market so here's something also for the post boomers this thing could be a easy 10 bagger 
but it also is something which you can feel good about. And this deposit also may be one of the first large mines to be carbon neutral. And then the final one that I think is going to be a big winner is, is Niobay Metals. And they have a, the James Bay Niobium project, which was found in the 60s and lost. And they finally got it into a public company. They got the social license from the First Nations to start a drilling campaign. They'll do a PEA. And I suspect that'll show that this is something worth 10 times what the market's pricing at. And niobium is an alloying metal for steel. It makes steel stronger, therefore it's lighter. They call this light weighting, and it's of, of, of great interest to the people who are worried about climate change, but it's also of interest uh, to people who drive big, uh, big Ford pickups and uh, burn a lot of gasoline, because if you can make this lighter, you waste less money on energy. So there's one that's perfect for everybody, uh, and, and uh, and that's the sort of companies out there, uh, you know, a whole spectrum of them that I think will do phenomenal, phenomenal this year. All right, John, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Once again, I'm Priscilla Barrera with the Investing News Network. And here with me today is John Kaiser of Kaiser Research.